Well, we're moving on now. We're moving on now. To the east side. To a deluxe apartment in the sky. Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today we're continuing our bare metal adventure with the RP2040. Like the song says, we're moving on up from executing our bare metal program from flash memory to static random access memory. This allows us to run longer programs at full speed. I'll need that capability in the future, so why don't you join me as we examine how to load and execute assembly language programs using SRAM. In the previous episode, I implemented PIO on the RP2040 using assembly language, but without using the SDK. The program was stored and executed using flash memory. However, now I want to execute programs out of static random access memory, or SRAM. That opens up opportunities for running longer and faster programs. Let's look at the RP2040 address map to see why. At the very bottom is 16K of read-only memory. This memory contains the initial startup routines, including the boot ROM, support for flash programming, USB mass storage device with UF2 support, and utility libraries such as fast floating point and memory copy routines. Then, starting at 100000 hex is the flash memory. Flash memory is slow, non-volatile storage, much like an SD card. It's erasable in blocks and has a finite lifetime. When UF2 files are uploaded to the RP2040, they wind up in flash memory. There can be several types and sizes of flash memory depending on the system's designer. The Raspberry Pi Pico's designer chose 2 megabytes of storage using the Windbomb W25Q80. The second stage bootloader configures this flash to achieve a maximum continuous read speed of about 15 megabytes per second at the Pico's default clock rate of 125 megahertz. Normal random access operation of the flash is even slower. This is at least an order of magnitude slower than the static RAM. However, flash memory can still be used as high-speed execute-in-place or XIP flash because there's a 16 kilobyte shadow static RAM that provides a read-only cache that operates at full speed. As long as the program's not too large, it can execute at nearly full speed. However, as program size increases above 16 kilobytes, execution speed decreases significantly as the cache requires more refreshing. Above the flash memory resides 264 kilobytes of static RAM, starting at 2000000 hex. This RAM is subdivided into six banks. There are four 64 kilobyte banks and two 4 kilobyte banks. Because the memory is common among the both cores and direct memory access, the four largest banks are striped to maximize throughput during shared operation. This means that consecutive words are routed to different memory banks as shown. You don't have to worry about striping for nearly all applications, but if it's a problem, there's a mirror that presents each bank in a non-striped manner. The smaller 4 kilobyte banks are not striped, which can be exploited for use such as stack operations for individual cores to limit conflicts between the cores for these frequently accessed regions. There are two additional segments of static RAM, the 16 kilobyte mirror for the flash memory and 4 kilobytes of dual ported RAM for USB communications. These are available for general use if not needed for their original intended application. Above 4000000 hex reside the various peripherals, I.O. registers, and the Cortex M0 Plus registers. We've already worked with some of those before, so I won't cover them here. Let's go back and look at what's stored in flash memory after loading a UF2 file. I'll refer to the map file for our PIO blinking program. The first chunk of code is a 256-byte second-stage bootloader, which configures the synchronous serial interface to use the flash memory. Following that, starting at 1000, 0100 is a vector table that points to the beginning of the desired code as well as for the different interrupt routines. The second stage bootloader uses the first and second words of the vector table to branch into the main program. Our main program starts at 1000 0200 hex. 
it executes at full speed out of the read-only RAM mirror. This program doesn't use any mutable variables, but if it did, those variables would hang out in the static RAM starting at 2000000 hex. During the linking process, the code for the main program is adjusted to run from this location in memory and no other. So, executing code from static RAM is not just a matter of copying that code from one location to another. The code needs to be linked to work within that specific chunk of memory. Let's go through the changes that will be needed to execute out of static RAM. First, we need the linker to adjust the code to execute out of SRAM. I'll choose the starting location of SRAM for the program, but it could be anywhere in SRAM. I'll get into the changes that we have to make to the linker script in just a minute. However, when the UF2 file is loaded into the RP2040, it's copied into flash memory, not into static RAM. We'll have to somehow copy the program from Flash into the proper location in static RAM. I'll add a helper function at the beginning of our program to copy the main program into SRAM. That program will execute out of Flash and will stay behind after the main program has been copied. As a result, we'll have two separate sections of code, one for the copy helper function that doesn't move and one for the main program that does move. Finally, the helper function needs to transfer execution to the main program after the main program has been copied into static RAM. Let's get into the linker script. I'll start with the linker script for the original PIO blinker program from Chapter 6 and go through the changes we need to make. For more information on linker scripts, please see Bare Metal Adventures Chapter 4. I'll put a link in the description below. The second stage bootloader is currently compiled to execute starting at 1000000 hex. That's because boot2 is the first section listed after the start of flash. Note that the load memory address, or LMA, and the virtual memory address, or VMA, are the same, which means this part will always run out of flash memory. This is always the case, regardless of where we run the main program. Next, the vector table resides at 1000-0100 hex. We have some flexibility with this, but for simplicity, I'll keep it the same when we relocate the main program to static RAM. This is where things start to differ between running the main program from XIP flash and static RAM. In both cases, we'll assign this main program to the reset section. For clarity, I'll refer to this program as reset from now on. The Chapter 6 reset program was located at 1000-0200 hex, the next page of memory above the vector table, and executed out of XIP flash memory. However, as I mentioned earlier, to run the reset program out of SRAM, we'll need a helper function to copy the reset program from flash into SRAM. This function will execute out of XIP flash and then stay behind during the copy process. I'll define another section called memcopy for this helper function. This will be compiled to execute starting at 1000-0200 hex, which means that the load memory address and the virtual memory address will be the same. The copy helper function needs to know where to start copying the reset program that we want to run from static RAM. I'll create a dummy section that allows us to flag the start of the load memory address of the reset program for use in the copy routine. I'll call that symbol reset load start. You might wonder why I just don't use the symbol memcopy end instead of creating a new section. It looks like it should be the same address. I want to demonstrate how you need to watch the map file. Notice in this example how there's a 12 byte difference between the memcopy end and the reset load start. That's because there are some word directives located outside the memcopy section, and the linker put those word directives between the memcopy and reset sections. When I put those word directives inside the memcop section, the linker places the word directives inside the memcopy section, and memcopy end and reset load start symbols point to the same address. That's why you need to always check the map file to make sure the symbols are working as you expect. 
Now we'll specify that the reset program will start at the beginning of static RAM. I'll create a reset section and assign the reset program to it. Then I'll create two symbols, reset start and reset end, to capture the virtual memory address or VMA of the reset program. At the end of the reset section, I'll differentiate between the VMA and the LMA by using this statement. The greater than symbol indicates that the VMA is in static RAM and the at greater than symbol identifies the LMA. This statement tells the linker script to link the reset program so it'll execute starting at the beginning of static RAM or 2000000 hex. That's pretty much the end of the linker script for our simple program. The remainder are placeholder statements that are for more complicated programs, so we don't have to worry about them at this time. Let's now look at the changes needed for the assembly program. I'll start with the original Chapter 6 PIO assembly program. Then I'll prepend the memory copy helper function. This routine will copy the reset program from flash to static RAM and then transfer execution to the reset program. I'll make use of one of the fast copy routines included as part of the RP2040 ROM. Let's go through this helper function in more detail. Here we'll bring in the symbols from the linker script. This is the starting address for the copied data in static RAM. This is the ending address for the data in static RAM. And this is the starting address for the data to be copied in flash memory. This statement specifies that the program that follows is the memcopy section. This statement calls a subroutine that invokes the memcopy44 copy function. The memcopy44 function uses a routine in the RP2040 ROM to fast copy bulk data. Per section 2.8.3.1.2, the function is started by first loading in pointers that are stored in location 14 and 18 hex into register 0 and 2 respectively. Then the code C4 is entered into register 1. This selects the memcopy44 function. The program then calls the ROM table lookup, which returns the address of the memcopy44 program in register 0. Note that this address already has bit 0 set in order to stay in thumb mode when a branch with link and exchange is used. We stash the address of memcopy44 into register 3. Then we enter the start of the copy destination range into register 0. That comes from the linker script and the word directive we set up earlier. Now we need to calculate the number of bytes we want to copy. We do this by subtracting the destination start from the destination end. That value goes into register 2. The start of the copy source range is loaded into register 1. Then we call the memcopy44 function starting at the address stored in register 3. Then we return. Now that the reset program has been copied from flash into static RAM, we can branch into static RAM. I'll load the start of the reset program into register 0 and then set bit 0 in order to stay in thumb mode. Then I'll use a branch with exchange to branch into the reset program. The reset program is almost identical to the one presented in the previous video, except I've added a couple extra troubleshooting routines. Let's try it out. I'll save the assembly program and linker script. Then in the Visual Studio command prompt, I'll call make clean in order to remove the old object, map, elf, uf2, and disassembly files. I'll call make all to compile the assembly and boot2 programs and the vector table. Then I'll use make link to call the linker script to create the elf and map files. Make uf2 will create the uf2 file from the elf file. Finally, this object dump statement will create a disassembly file. Before we test the program, let's check the map and disassembly files. I want to make sure the programs are properly located and the variable lists are word aligned. From the map file, we see that the memcopy section starts at 100, 0200 as expected, and 
The reset section starts at 2000000 hex at the beginning of static RAM. So far, so good. Let's check the disassembly file for word alignment. Here, this data is word aligned. Word align means that the memory location for the start of the words ends in a 0, 4, 8, or C. Here, I see that the PIO program and defined data aren't word aligned. That won't work. I'll add a no-op just before the PIO program as a half word pad instruction. Let's compile and check again. Good, these are word aligned now. Let's test it out. Just like in chapter six, the LED blinks for each PIO instruction being copied. Then the LED attached to GPIO4 starts to blink while the onboard LED also blinks. Perfect. Now we're executing our program out of static RAM. Thanks for joining me today. This time we modified a program to execute out of static RAM. This will let me run large programs at higher speeds than programs that run exclusively out of flash. I'm sure there are a few things I could have done more efficiently, but I'm learning as I go. For you assembly language purists, please let me know where I can improve. I hope to use these techniques in the future for some fairly ambitious projects, so stay tuned. If you like this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon.